This is a fun page where we'll talk about the mechanism of disease. I think it will be helpful for you if throughout this page you consider the analogy of an intruder in this example the pathogen breaking into a house your body or this could also just be the micro because they don't all make us sick so three things have to happen for bacteria to actually make us ill first is that they have to get in we usually use the word adhere have to be able to stick to us. The second thing they have to be able to accomplish is to not have the cops called on them, right? They need to avoid detection or arrest. And what that really means in bacteria language is they need to avoid phagocytosis being engulfed by our white blood cells, our macrophages. So the first thing they need to do is adhere. The second thing they need to do is avoid phagocytosis once they're sticking there. But lots of bacteria do that in our gut. E. coli does that. Lactobacillus does that. Staph epi does that on our skin. Streptococcus salivarius does that in our mouth. And on and on, all of these bacteria that are part of us, but they are not making us sick. In fact, in many cases, they're helping us. So, in order for them to really make us sick, the third requirement down here under number three is that true pathogens damage us somehow. Those are the three ingredients for something, uh, for a pathogen making us ill. Okay, now we'll go back up to the top and kind of flesh some of these out. So getting in and adhering, bacteria usually accompl accomplish this with the aid of a capsule or a slime layer. In other words, a glycocalyx. Another way that they uh, tend to be very good at attaching, as in the case of E. coli, fimbriae, little hair-like projections that help them hang on to our cells. Okay, now let's look at how they can avoid detection or capture. One way, again, it comes back to that capsule. So the capsule can both help them adhere and also avoid phagocytosis. Most pathogens have a capsule. Streptococcus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, if it doesn't have a capsule, it is usually non-virulent and doesn't cause disease. Whereas if it does have a capsule, it is more likely to be able to cause disease. Okay, let's look at another method that bacteria can use to avoid phagocytosis. Making enzymes, and in particular, the one I'd like to show you is coagulase. You will hopefully remember that staphylococcus is gram positive and in clusters. So I'm gonna put some purple cells here. And then all those strands are fibrinogen. So the example I'm giving you here is Staph aureus can make an enzyme called coagulase. And then it can cause, so this is a fibrin mesh that it can encourage. And I'll use a blue pen to tell you how it does this. So Basically, Staph aureus is able to wall itself off from your white blood cells. And this is why some of its infections uh, have a famous kind of trait of being walled off. Think of a boil. 
or an abscess, like maybe in the case of cat infections, maybe cellulitis, etc. So they can wall themselves off from the white blood cells with this enzyme that causes the host fibrinogen to activate into fibrin and make a clot. Now we'll use a green highlighter to show you another example. It's kind of famous. This green squiggle represents the waxy cell wall of mycobacterium. Makes it hard for bacteria to be engulfed by our white blood cells. So I'm going to use the green again. The example here is mycobacterium. In fact, this can be so effective that sometimes, even if mycobacterium does eventually get phagocytosed by the host white blood cells, it is unable to be destroyed by those white blood cells. So tuberculosis can be a very um, hard disease to eradicate. And then yet another example, this is actually parasitic worms where they secrete calming signals. And what I mean by calming signals are signals that tell your immune system to not overreact. And the example I'll give you there are uh, parasitic worms. This may be one of the reasons why people that are infected with parasitic worms are not very likely to have allergies because their entire immune system is calmed down and not overreacting as it's known to do in allergies. Okay, and then one last fun one. Notice I've drawn like a little guy here and what if I told you this is still the guy but he's just changed his outfit and he is now disguised as someone else. We call that antigenic variation. And to really a lot of different kinds of pathogens can do this. What it means is that let's say the pathogen was um, you know, wearing certain identifying flags or what we call antigens one season, and then uh, the next season it's wearing different antigens or identifying flags so that your immune system doesn't even recognize it anymore as a pathogen. And sure enough, that might have rung a bell with you. Yes, influenza. The flu is like this. Influenza performs antigenic variation virtually every year. Uh, and that's why trying to make a vaccine to it is always a tricky topic because you don't know which costume it's going to be wearing from year to year. Uh, protus are also pretty good at this, things like malaria, which might make it very difficult to develop um, permanent immunity to malaria because the protus that causes it can perform a lot of different antigenic variation, much like the flu. Okay, so um, lots of fun ways to avoid phagocytosis. The capsule helps avoid phagocytosis. Staph aureus makes an enzyme that makes a clot around it in your own bloodstream or in tissues, uh, causing it to be walled off from white blood cells. Mycobacterium is slippery because it has a waxy cell wall. It's hard to engulf, and even if it is engulfed by a white blood cell, hard to destroy. And then some um, microbes might secrete calming signals, or in this case, this isn't even a microbe, parasitic worms might secrete chemicals that calm your whole immune system down so you don't attack it. And then lastly, uh, microbes can vary. Oh, actually, worms do this too. I should put this. So uh, worms are also good at antigenic variation. Lots of micro or pathogens are. So uh, this last example, though, would be that the organism is wearing a particular costume, meaning particular antigens on its surface one season, and then every season, maybe it changes out which antigens it has on its surface, changes its costume, so your immune system can never recognize it as the same pathogen from year to year.
Okay, let's make a note right here before we go on to causing damage. Because so far, nothing, you haven't been hurt, right? I guess a clot isn't so good. But a lot of these things, it's not like it's making you sick yet. So normal flora successfully adhere and avoid being phagocytosed. They have to be able to do step one and two or they wouldn't be part of your normal flora. They are like an intruder that makes itself at home, eh, but they'll help out with the dishes too, right? Think of E. coli. It makes vitamin Bs for you and vitamin K. Think of lactobacillus. It helps crowd out uh, candida and it helps crowd out salmonella, etc. So the true bad guys do something else. They damage us somehow. They either damage us with exotoxins or with endotoxins or, in some cases, even with both. Now, for the endotoxin, I'm going to use a pink highlighter because you know that only gram-negative cells have an endotoxin because it's part of their lipid layer outside of their peptidoglycan. Okay, as I'm checking the time on this video, I'm going to go ahead and stop here and then pick up with a second video to finish up this page.